Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Hannah Fuller. I'm a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for a webinar on the report that was released earlier this month titled Constructing Valid Geospatial Tools for Environmental Justice. You can now download a copy of the report and other supporting materials at www.nap.edu. A recording of this webinar will be available on our website in the coming weeks with an announcement that will be sent out when it is available. For those of you not familiar with the U.S. National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are private, nonprofit institutions that provide independent, objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy, policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study's statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee and must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. I have some members of the committee with me here today, but before I introduce them, I want to go over a few reminders. Please note that this webinar is scheduled to last one hour. We'll start off with a presentation summarizing the report by the committee members, and then we'll open it up to any questions you may have. To ask a question, just click the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and type your question. You can submit a question at any time during the presentation, and we'll get to as many questions as we can at the end of the presentation. This report was sponsored by the Bezos Earth Fund and written by an ad hoc committee established by the Board on Earth Sciences and Resources, Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology, and the Board on Mathematical Sciences and An Analytics. We have some members of the committee that wrote the report with us here today. They are Harvey Miller, committee co-chair from Ohio State University, Eric Tate, committee co-chair from Princeton University, Walker Wheeland, committee member from uh, California EPA, Marcos Luna, a committee member from Salem State University, and Kathleen Segerson, committee member from the University of Connecticut. If you have any questions about the study, please contact Samantha Magsino, National Academy Staff Director of the Study Committee. And with that, I'll turn it over to Harvey Miller to get us started. Okay, thank you very much, Hannah. And uh, welcome everyone to this um, report release webinar on constructing geospatial valid geospatial tools for environmental justice. As we all know, uh, geospatial science and technologies are crucial for analyzing the environmental burdens of marginalized communities. And our report is an opportunity to provide data strategies for the climate and environmental justice screening tool or CGES. Our primary audience is the White House Council on Environmental Quality, federal agencies, and others who will use this tool and its future iterations. But we also intend to provide a foundation and framework for constructing valid geospatial tools for environmental justice more generally. So the slide you're seeing right here is, is some considerations for our study. Some background is that a presidential executive order was signed creating the Justice 40 initiative. As part of this, the White House CEQ was instructed to create a geospatial environmental justice tool to identify disadvantaged communities. CEQ responded quickly and created the first national level tool for this task. And there was a desire to consider data strategies for future iterations of CGEST and related tools. So a crucial consideration is that we are not doing an evaluation of CGEST per se, but rather using CGEST as a starting point to discuss how these tools can be developed looking forward for CEQ, for federal agencies, and for other governmental levels and groups with interest in geospatial tools to support environmental justice. Next slide, please. So this is our state of statement of task, which has four major, major components. One is scanning existing environmental justice screening tools for types of data and approaches to identify disadvantaged communities, identifying the types of data needed for CEQ screening tool and tools in the future, evaluating current data availability, quality, resolutions, and key data gaps, and discuss approaches for processing, integrating, and analyzing these data. 
Now, ultimately, what we did is we provide an overall data set strategy for CGEST and CGEST-like geospatial tools to understand, analyze, and support policy decisions to address environmental justice. Uh, next slide, please. Now, in making our recommendations, the committee took the approach of this as being a general problem, focusing on the process needed to create future iterations of CGEST and other geospatial environmental justice tools. We provide a range of possibilities and identify the knowledge gaps throughout the report. And although we discuss possible data sets, we do not recommend specific data sets. We do suggest some data sets that may be considered and provide processes for choosing and validating data sets based on the tool purpose. But again, our, our, our approach here and our recommendations as you'll see later is to identify the process by which these tools can be developed. Next slide, please. So this shows how our report is structured. Chapter one provides the genesis and background of the study, including the important, the important statement of task. Chapter two gives background on the concept of community disadvantage, including the structural factors and historic processes that led to the situation we see today, and the key concept of cumulative burdens on communities. This chapter sets the stage for the measurement and tool construction problems we address in the remainder of the report. Chapter three addresses the challenge at the heart of building valid geospatial tools for environmental justice, how to construct composite indicators. A composite indicator brings together measurements from multiple dimensions of a complicated concept, such as community disadvantage, to derive a single value to reflect the condition being measured. This chapter describes the best practices we see in science and in practice, including emphasis on meaningful community engagement throughout the entire process. Chapter four comprises our scan of existing environmental justice tools, which is a key part in our statement of task. Chapter five reviews the selection and analysis of indicators in CGEST and provides practical guidelines for indicator selection more generally. Chapter six discusses the key problem in a key problem in composite indicator construction, how to scale, weight, and integrate individual indicators that comprise the composite indicator. We pay, we pay particular attention to the methods in the current vision of CGEST, current version of CGEST and potential alternatives. And this chapter also discusses how to capture cumulative burdens through in, in, indicator integration. Chapter seven discusses the important process of tool validation for elevating the trustworthiness and utility of these geospatial tools. And chapter eight summarizes our recommendations, which we'll talk about in detail today. Next slide, please. So these, um, part of our statement of tasks was to consider existing EJ tools, how they're conceptualized and constructed. And this is one of the first tasks that the committee took on. We looked at 13 federal, state, and international tools illustrating a range of approaches to measuring environmental justice and community disadvantage, including the intended use and resulting output, the type of burden indicators, data formats, and aggregation and cumulative impacts. And you could see in the screen there, a list of some of the acronyms corresponding to the 13 tools that, that we looked at. And there are lot, lots of details in the report in, in the, about these tools in Appendix C. Next slide, please. So the committee developed this conceptual framework to, to uh, think about and to formulate our discussion surrounding uh, these, these type of geospatial tools. This was derived from our open workshops, testimony from experts, talking to people lived, with lived experience and practice, and also talking among the committee. So I'll, I'll walk you through this really quickly. The inner ring shows the core of how to develop these type of environmental justice tools. At the core is a structured and iterative process, a development process that encompasses the decisions indicated in the graphics, which we'll hear about in this in, in a little bit, in just a little, little bit. The middle ring surrounding the structured iterative development process indicates how this process needs to be embedded needs to have substantive and meaningful community engagement throughout the process, careful validation of the tools and its output, and good and accessible documentation of all decisions made in the tool development. And in the outer ring, you see that the structured iterative development process embedded in that careful setting of 
validation, community engagement, and documentation leads to these desired outcomes, which is trust in the tool by all parties, transparency in how its results were derived, and legitimacy in the sense that it captures real world conditions with validity. Now, at this point, I'll hand it off to Walker Whelan, who will start walk, walking us through some of the um, recommendations. Walker? All right. Thank you, Harvey. Great. So on to recommendation one, community engagement. So effectively achieving the elements of this diagram, the outer elements, require more than just statistical tests to achieve results that are valid and accepted. A data strategy, especially for environmental justice tools, includes systematic and sustained community engagement. And it can be challenging to think about how to do meaningful community engagement with large scale screening tools such as CGEST, but it is possible. And this really is represented as a shift in the spectrum of public participation, moving from informing to involving to ultimately empowering communities in the co-development of environmental justice tools. And how is this represented? Well, it's represented as community partnerships working to develop plans to operationalize community input, being transparent about how that input will be addressed and creating an involvement process that's non-burdensome and also includes underrepresented communities at the table. Next slide, please. On to documentation. So as conditions are changing in our physical and social environment, as technology and the science evolves, and as we're adjusting to new issues and challenges that we're facing, there will never be a single best data set or method for doing this type of work. However, no matter how good or valid a tool is, the outer ring here, the transparency, trust, and legitimacy will be questioned if the tool is not accompanied by thorough documentation. And you can't really begin to have real meaningful conversations on how to improve these types of tools without thorough and accessible documentation of the indicator design process and decisions, along with descriptions and rationale for all major indicator construction components. Next slide, please. All right, on to validation. So once you've generated a tool, how do you externally check that the tool does what you intended it to do? Tool validation is a nuanced yet a crucial process. And there are important validation methodologies that need to be applied throughout tool construction. So some examples here on the screen are ground truthing, uh, measuring uh, observed phenomena as it relates to model phenomena. Convergent validation, how well does a uh, given tool, for example, at the national scale, uh, how well is it represented or how well does it align with uh, local tools that might measure the same sorts of dimensions and the same kind of concept to be measured? And lastly, community validation, taking maps of the tool or uh, showing the tool on, on the screen uh, to communities that you're attempting to represent in the first place and, and, and asking them uh, if what you've created represents their lived experience. Another type of validation is this very broad term of supplemental analysis, which in our report refers to comparing the output of the EJ screening tool against external variables to further validate that tool's findings. So the purpose of these are to ensure that a tool and its findings are rooted in the realities and lived experience of communities. And to get there, well, this work needs to be done in consultation with communities community experts and researchers, which ultimately contributes to improvements in the elements of the outer ring on the screen. So I will now pass the presentation over to my colleague, Dr. Marcos Luna. Thank you, Walker. So recommendation number four, it's about using a structured development process. So a structured and iterative development process is at the core of constructing valid geospatial tools for environmental justice. Um, in the center of our conceptual framework, you can see the four types of interrelated, interrelated decisions. Um, and as you will see in chapter three of our report, 
we were inspired by a report by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, or the OECD, and specifically their pocket guide to composite indicators and scoreboards. This report does not specify how to construct a particular composite index, but rather the 10 steps or decisions that must be made uh, when constructing any composite index. And it's important to realize that these 10 steps or decisions are nonlinear. This is not a sequential development model, rather it's more akin to an agile development process, nonlinear, iterative, prototyping, testing, and community engagement throughout the process. Next slide, please. Indicator selection is a key component of a structured composite indicator development process. An indicator is a quantitative proxy for an abstract concept, such as exposure, access, or disadvantage. We measure an abstract concept like disadvantage by identifying an indicator that represents an important characteristic or dimension of disadvantage, such as economic insecurity. If economic insecurity is the indicator, we must decide how to operationalize this indicator by selecting a specific data set to measure economic insecurity, such as family income, poverty status, or possibly workforce participation. There are many possible choices, both for indicators and the data sets used to operationalize the indicator. Indicator selection and the data sets used to operationalize those indicators should be based on a systematic, transparent, and inclusive process that considers both technical criteria and practicality. Next slide, please. So technical characteristics emphasize representational, statistical, and geospatial aspects of indicator data and are typically the focus of analysts and modelers. These include validity, sensitivity, specificity, robustness, reproducibility, and scale. An important technical criterion is validity, how well the indicator reflects lived experience. And validity can be further broken down into different forms of validity, how well the indicator measures what's supposed to, how well the indicator aligns with related indicators, and how well the indicator represents all the important dimensions of the underlying concept. Practical characteristics are generally of greater interest to indicator program managers and end users. Practical criteria include measurability, availability, simplicity, affordability, credibility, and relevance. One important practical characteristic of an indicator is its credibility. Credibility is the believability and salience of the indicator for scientific and technical applications, as well as for the public. This is also referred to as community validation and buy-in. We need to evaluate measures in consultation with federal agencies, technical experts, and community partners. Engaging community members and other interested and affected parties iteratively throughout the indicator selection and integration process is an essential aspect of building the credibility of an environmental justice tool and engendering trust. Next slide, please. Based on the current formulation of CGEST, no indicator is as important as the socioeconomic indicator for identifying disadvantaged communities. There are 30 indicators across eight categories of burden, any of which can be part of the designation of disadvantage. However, for a tract or census tract to be designated as disadvantaged, it must meet the socioeconomic threshold. And for seven of the eight burden categories, that burden threshold is pegged to the federal poverty level. And there are at least three challenges with this socioeconomic indicator. One is, except for Alaska and Hawaii, the federal poverty value applies one value to the entire country. So in this case, a little over $30,000 a year for a family of four. Whether the community is urban or rural, whether in the Northeast or the Southeast or the West Coast, it does not take into account cost of living differences across the country, which can be significant, and which means it doesn't necessarily do the best job of capturing the reality on the ground. There are other metrics that explicitly incorporate cost of living differences, for example, the percentage of area media income used by the Department of Housing and Urban Development to determine housing assistance eligibility. The second issue is that measures of income are not the same thing as measures of wealth, and wealth is arguably a better and more accurate reflection of economic security or capacity, which is affected by generational economic advantages or disadvantages. In addition, research shows that wealth disparities are actually more pronounced than income disparities. And there are metrics of wealth, such as home ownership rate, median home value, and other weighted income metrics. A third issue is that there may be significant economic variation within the same community. And these differences or disparities may be hidden 
when aggregated at the level of, say, a census tract. One approach to deal with this issue is to consider measures of income inequality, such as a Gini coefficient, which can measure economic inequality within communities or census tracts. Next slide, please. Due to legal and policy concerns, data on race or ethnicity has been excluded as an explicit factor in identifying disadvantaged communities in CJS. Our report does not address this legal or policy context. Rather, it looks at the science and scholarship on disadvantage and disparities in environmental exposure and health. What we found is that race and ethnicity have been shown to be consistent and statistically independent predictors of a range of social, economic, health, and environmental inequities, and are often more significant than economic indicators of socioeconomic status. Socioeconomic status is not a substitute indicator for metrics of racism or race. Next slide, please. Scholarship across the health and social sciences makes clear that racism is a fundamental cause of disadvantage in other social, economic, health, and environmental inequalities in the United States. The empirical basis for the importance of measuring racism are many. Historical race-based policies and practices in housing, transportation, and other forms of community development have had lasting impacts on environmental inequality today. We see that, for example, in the way that communities redlined in the 1930s continue to experience pronounced racial segregation and economic and environmental inequality. Race or ethnicity is strongly and consistently associated with disproportionate exposure to a variety of environmental stressors, hazardous waste, air pollution, noise, lead exposure, contaminated water, excessive heat, also associated with disproportionate absence of environmental and public amenities, access to recreational space, access to affordable and healthy food sources, access to healthcare, functional public infrastructure, and even equal enforcement of environmental laws. Race is an important quantitative predictor of unequal exposure and outcomes, independently and sometimes more significantly than income or socioeconomic status. Minoritized racial or ethnic groups within the same socioeconomic status systematically experience greater exposures or burdens relative to their white counterparts. Race and ethnicity interact with socioeconomic status in complex ways to produce unequal exposures and outcomes. Health science scholars, schools of medicine and public health, and health organizations now explicitly recognize racism as a key social determinant of health and a fundamental cause of health inequalities. Asthma, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, kidney disease, low birth weight, pregnancies, infant mortality, disability patterns, lower life expectancies, and on, often connected to differential exposures to environmental stressors. Measuring and monitoring racism can happen in a variety of ways. Social, economic, and environmental disparities between racial groups are due to racism, not race itself. Race is not equivalent to racism. Racism is a multidimensional phenomenon that includes the total ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through a variety of reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, and even the criminal justice system. And these patterns and practices in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, behaviors, and ultimately the distribution of resources, like wealth. There are literally dozens of metrics now available to measure racism and its various dimensions. A number of these use geographic approaches to measure structural racism and quantify the magnitude of its impacts. These include measures of residential segregation, measures of racialized economic segregation, and indexes of, excuse me, indexes of disproportionality. We describe examples of these metrics and their uses in the text of the report and list a subset of these in the appendices. Measures of racism or race need to be disaggregated. Racialized experiences are not the same for all minoritized racial and ethnic groups. Using monolithic indicators like minority risks masking important differences in the experiences of different populations and communities. Properly collecting data on race and ethnicity and disaggregating racial and ethnic categories is essential in order to monitor the state of racial ethnic disparities, to properly identify differences in population experiences of racism and inequity, and to avoid perpetuating or exacerbating racism through the erasure of real differences between and within population groups. Now I'll pass it over to my colleague, Eric Tate. Thank you, Marcos. Um, so after, once we have the indicators selected, um, 
Integrating them or, or combining them involves some mathematical, statistical, and geospatial modeling decisions. And there are three main parameters shown here on the slide. The first is normalization. So normalization facilitates comparison. So for example, um, comparing wildfire risk that's in the climate change burden category and particulate matter expo uh, uh, exposure, which is in the transportation um, category. Uh, and doing so can pose some challenges, um, particularly depending on the distribution of the data. So if you have a lot of observations that are close to one another or another data set where there's outliers, choosing a different normalization routine or scheme can change sort of the representation of the information. So one of the good things about the CGES documentation that we found is that they do a very good job. Like for example, in, in talking about how they arrived at the normalization scheme that they selected. The second is weighting. So the purpose of weighting is to imbue differential importance of, of indicators. Uh, for example, uh, may perhaps legacy pollution and energy costs aren't the same in terms of their impact on um, generating a disadvantaged community. Uh, statistically, however, highly correlated indicators when used together can result in double counting. So there's some things to consider during weighting. Uh, aggregation is the act of putting multiple indicators together, but how you go about combining them can matter. So some typical approaches are addition, or multiplication, uh, but ultimately the way that the indicators are aggregated should mimic the way that these processes work in the real world. Next slide, please. So here's an example of uh, the effect of different aggregation approaches on the designation of places. Here we have two census tracts uh, in Louisiana and Florida. Each of these tracks, in each of these tracks, it exceeds the, the 90th percentile uh, for at least one of the indicators in the health burden category. Um, and it exceeds the 65th percentile for the low income uh, threshold. Now, these, both of these tracks are designated as disadvantaged. And using a scheme like this, it's, it's fairly easy to understand. However, note that the Louisiana tract exceeds thresholds in four different health indicators, but the Florida tract exceeds in only in one, but both are, get the same designation as disadvantaged. Next. Um, so now let's consider an alternative approach. Here, the indicator values are added or multiplied together. You can see that both the sum and the product of the aggregation leads to cumulative uh, values for the Louisiana tract that are higher than for the Florida tract. Uh, next. Now let's bring in two additional places to this comparative exercise. The census tracts here are in Alabama and North Carolina. Most of the health indicators for these two locations fall below the 90th percentile, but just barely. Neither exceeds the low income threshold. Therefore, neither of these census tracts are designated as disadvantaged. However, the aggregated values, if you're looking by the sum or the product, both exceed those of the Florida tract. So it's not unreasonable to conclude that these two tracts face a higher level of cumulative burden than the Florida tract. The, all of this is just to show that these different approaches um, can lead to very different designations. Next slide, please. So when we talk about cumulative impacts, this is what we mean, the total burden from stressors and their interactions. Um, the current scoring of CGEST, however, ignores cumulative impacts. But in reality, uh, we know that environmental and social burdens do accumulate uh, in at least three different potential ways. Number one, accumulation of really high levels of a single stressor. And this is sort of what's reflected in CGEST right now, uh, using these, these 90th percentile thresholds, for example. However, burdens can also accumulate through multiple stressors that are happening at the same time. And you see this kind of scoring reflected in other EJ tools at the state level. 
but there can also be interactions among the stressors. And so trying to represent that in scoring can be a challenge. What we do know is that uh, the minority, when you consider cumulative scoring, that the minority composition is higher in disadvantaged tracks with multiple stressors than they are in single stressors. And so uh, there is sort of a, a distinct imprint of, of you know, racial and ethnic difference just by looking at multiple stressors. Unfortunately, the scientific understanding right now for how burdens accumulate is lacking. This is the subject of a brand new uh, National Academy studies that's just getting underway. Uh, but we, what one, one of the things that we stress in the report is that these assessments of cumulative impacts, they really need to involve communities uh, because you know, people that are experiencing these burdens of underinvestment and pollution, they much likely have a much deeper understanding of how burdens accumulate perhaps than researchers. Next slide, please. So we arrive at recommendation number eight from our report is that to designate communities as disadvantaged using cumulative impact scoring uh, based on understanding of the science, the needs of the users, and of course, in partnership with uh, communities. And to do so using uh, these, you know, perhaps threshold approaches where it's multiple burdens exceeded that qualify for disadvantage. Or maybe it's multiple categories that are exceeded like health or climate or energy, or perhaps an aggregation-based approach where these burdens, this, the normalized values are added or multiplied. Next slide, please. So th this figure here on, on this slide is showing disadvantaged communities based on the number of CGES categories that are exceeded by the threshold. So by categories again here, categories of health, climate, transportation, energy, et cetera. And just by using, this is available in the existing CGES structure, you can arrive at a different sort of spatial distribution of potential prioritization of places. Here, the darker colors represent uh, places where there's more than one uh, category that's been exceeded. And doing such cumulative scoring, it, it allows you to better discern the communities facing single and multiple stressors. It's used in other tools. Uh, and we outline some potential ways to go about it. Next slide, please. Uh, the last recommendation in the report is around assessing internal robustness. And the recommendation is to conduct what's known as uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. Essentially, these tools, this approach is allows to understand the effect of all the modeling decisions. So we can think of these EJ tools as fairly simple indicators, but they involve a lot of decisions that are embedded around the choice of indicators, the model structure, for example, CGES saying that you need to exceed the 90, you know, the percentile of an environmental burden and the low income burden. That's the structure of a model. Um, normalization, weighting and aggregation, how are you doing cumulative scoring, some things we didn't talk about are sort of the error that's inherent in census data, uh, how you're going to handle that or not, um, imp imputing uh, missing values, all sorts of decisions that are made and through uncertainty and sensitivity analysis, they can be assessed. Next slide, please. And so why conduct such sensitivity analysis? Well, if you can really understand the effect of these different modeling decisions, uh, but ultimately it is a core best practice of indicator construction. So it's uh, we highly recommend this. Uh, it provides a more transparent, greater transparency for the modeling process, which is alignment with some of the things that Walker was talking around, sort of documentation and transparency. And it can help avoid negative policy outcomes. Um, so for example, this uh, slide is showing how you could go about doing sensitivity analysis. Instead of building the tool one time, you, you build it thousands of times using all the potential choices. And you can see where sort of the 
the tool, the designation of communities becomes a distribution of values rather than just a single one. And um, so we can answer questions, for example, how dependent is the designation on potentially fragile, fragile modeling assumptions where maybe you do one normalization approach versus another one and it really changes which places are designated. Uh, the ones that are really fragile, you might now have a focus on which decisions to pay more attention to and uh, greater methodological or data development. And, and finally, to understand which places would be designated under alternative modeling decisions. So for example, how many places are designated when you build it this way or that way? What's the distribution of urban and rural places that are designated? What's the minority composition of the places in, in, in different modeling um, schema? Next slide, please. And so that's sort of a walk through the, the our findings of our, of our report. Um, we're gonna transition now to sort of Q and A. Um, you can find the report on the National Academies Press website um, shown here, or you can scan this QR code. Um, and for now, I'll turn it back over to Hannah. Thanks, Eric. And thanks to all of the committee members who are able to present and join us here today. Um, thank you all for the great questions that have already been coming in through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If more questions come up, uh, please don't hesitate to jump in there and submit them. We'll get to as many as we can uh, during these next 24 precious minutes that we have. Um, so I'll, I'll get us started. Um, We've got some great questions that I'm just going to pose to all of uh, our panelists here, and then whoever feels like coming off a of mute and answering first, uh, just just go for it here. So, first off, um, one of our questions from the audience is: How can you equitably account for rural environmental justice issues through a tool so that certain environmental justice issues are not systematically ignored? For example, avoiding methodologies that under-recognize rural environmental justice because of spatial parameter limitations. Well, certainly one of the approaches uh, that I just was talking about was conducting uncertainty and sensitivity analysis. And so um, by doing so, perhaps to achieve certain policy goals, Maybe there's a you know uh, an ideal set distribution of rural versus urban places. We can look at the different modeling approaches and see how they result in different distributions, and um, you know have a greater understanding of how to you know make choices in the tool development that reach that policy out, out objective. Perhaps just add one other comment to that, and that is that I think we emphasize a lot the importance of community engagement, and I think that through that community engagement process, that's where we can identify if there are holes in a tool, things that are important indicators that are being missed. So it's really incumbent on communities, uh, in some sense, for their participation to make the, the tool developers aware of um, what some of these uh, burdens are that might be missing from the tool so that they can be added. And along those lines about consulting with communities, um, one of our uh, audience members was wondering why recommendation five suggests consultation with communities when evaluating measures rather than another level of community participation um, when you're working with communities. So I could I guess I can jump in there. Um, we do say that in recommendation five is part of a broader kind of um, discussion. But if you look back at recommendation one in our report, you see we place a very strong emphasis on creating and sustaining community partnerships. And throughout the report, you'll see us emphasizing the fact that there needs to be meaningful community engagement. We talk about different levels of community engagement, and we also talk about things like YEMA's principles on how to how to do community engagement. What are the best practices? So, um, I I think that word perhaps it's been overemphasized in in your question in recommendation five, because this was a very strong theme that runs through our entire report is building meaningful community partnerships in order to conduct engagement. Thanks, Harvey. 
Um, our next audience question is, uh, how does a framework consider geospatial and environmental justice literacy in your report? I could, I could start and then I welcome the other committee members to, to jump in. I think that's really part of um, two elements of, of what we talked about in that middle ring about documentation and also about, um, about, about community engagement. So, you know, thinking about geospatial and, and EJ literacy and what sort of um, terminology is used and um, uh, what sort of discussions are being made at different levels of technicality. I think that you having clear documentation of your process is the first step, but then also, you know, taking that documentation and, and bringing it to communities and getting their input on what's the best way to describe what we're trying to represent here. Uh, what are um, what are some different ways that this information might be distributed rather than just a, a big report? So I think that really leaning into those two are ways where you can um, get a very similar playing field as it relates to um, those issues. And I'll address the geospatial liter literacy part of that. Um, that was a concern of the committee. It wasn't directly in our statement of task, but we thought it was very important that we, that this, these tools have very good user interface design, which will be very map centric because since they are mapping tools. So we do have a, a box on, in chapter three that talks about the ways that which you can go about designing the interface, the, the, the map interface and the combined interface in order to make sure that this tool communicates well. And we also talk about some of the other issues surrounding geospatial data, such as the modifiable aerial unit problem, which says that the way you aggregate the data and then the levels of aggregation and the zonation system can affect the results of the of the of the measurements you're doing. So we we do touch upon those in, in chapter three of the report. Just one quick follow up as well. I think we really did want the report to be broadly accessible, though, so that there's not in, um, a lot of technical detail in the in the main body of the reports, um, so that the the level of technical competency or familiarity that someone has to have um, to understand the report, hopefully, it's well within um, the lay. I definitely noticed that with the report, you guys do a great job of straddling both the really deep technical stuff, as well as for those of us that are newer to understanding this field really uh, can understand. Um, so uh, another another question that we got from the audience is asking about if gender or single parent households should be considered when looking at environmental justice in tools such as CGEST. I can start with that one. So one of the things we do address in the report is intersectionality, uh, and which means that you know when you look at the conditions on the ground that families or communities face, you have to consider not just single qualities like uh, income or um, you know a, a, an environmental exposure, but the combination of things. So like single parent households or other circumstances that can make dealing with those issues harder. Um, and so intersectionality is something that that I think a lot of modelers are struggling with. Um, but we definitely address that and we talk about how that might be integrated into thinking about what you're measuring and how you measure it and the different kinds of metrics that you might choose and the indicators. So this is certainly something that has to be considered carefully as well. But uh, as far as I know, there aren't a lot of examples of that. Um, but that's certainly a really good point and that we also bring it up in the report too. Got a lot of questions about other things to bring in and, and be considered. Another question um, is about how can indigenous traditional indigenous frameworks and knowledge be in, incorporated into these sorts of models. Um, so wondering if anybody has uh, any thoughts about that, or, or if there are places in the report where you could point to with with this question. So I'll start again. Um, the um... One of the, the core thing that we keep emphasizing and that we emphasize throughout the report is about the community uh, co-production of these products. And, and part of that is uh, thinking through what we're measuring, how we're measuring it, why we're measuring it, and um, and the process of, of understanding how we can go about capturing these things that matter to communities. 
And those aren't always apparent because if we just look at current practice or data availability, that may not reveal the things that are important to these communities. And so that can only really happen through discussion and conversation and, and, and learning in that process. And it may require rethinking how the, the tool works. Um, and I think that's something that we are encouraging tool developers, not just for CGES, but any tool developer to think through carefully about how it is that you uh, go about thinking about what you're trying to measure and how, and then how you measure that. Um, and so that there's no single answer to that because it may vary from community to community, but the conversation has to be begun in order to get at that point. And that's a, it's a really com core component, which is also why it's hard to anticipate what the final product or final data set might look like because that will evolve out of the process. And I unmuted, I was gonna say the same thing Marco said, but I'll, I'll just add to that, that we did think about these things in the development of our report. In fact, we had an open workshop in which the proceedings are available publicly, in which we brought in so, some voices, the very diverse voices, including you know indigenous people to talk about um, some of the issues they're facing in their lived experience of community disadvantage. So it's something that we considered at, at the very beginning of developing this report. And again, as Marco said, th this is where it comes down to bringing in meaningful community engagement in developing these type of um, data strategies for EJ tools. Thanks, Harvey. Our next question that I'm gonna pull from the audience questions um, is uh, is really kind of what you guys were uh, kind of touching on just now. Um, and it's, if a truly disadvantaged community is not captured in a tool, should scoring for the geographic area in the tool be changed or should the actual tool or model itself be changed? Let me just um, start with one comment on that, and, and then others can chime in. I think the question, if we, if it appears that something is missing, so that there's a community that's not being included, then I think the first question is why, and what is it that's um, causing that? And I think that has to be assessed before the question that you're posing, Hannah, can be answered. You know, is it a, a, something about the tool itself? Is it something? Um, about the way that the tool is being applied, you know. So, what exactly is causing that uh, community that would normally be viewed as disadvantaged to somehow be falling through the cracks? Um, yeah, and ultimately, the what we're advocating for in this report is number one, deeper introspection on what is to be modeled in the first place. Um, conducting that modeling, and then on the and then at the back end, sort of evaluating rigorously the the degree to which you know the final model uh, looks like what you intended to do, and so I think by adopting a more structured process, uh, these gaps will be more easily illuminated. Um, so that's certainly a core theme of the report. You. Okay, the questions keep coming in, so I'm going to get through as many as we can here. Um, the, our next question is, did the committee discuss ways of incorporating qualitative data into a map interface? Yeah, I can, I can start on, on that one. So in, in Chapter 7, uh, Validation, we talk a little bit about um, really new and, and, and really interesting approaches around this work called mixed methods. And so um, this is basically a, a description of incorporating this combination of um, quantitative, semi-quantitative, or qualitative data um, into these types of approaches. So um, there's there's discussion of that there, and it really represents a, a bit of a paradigm shift away from these more stringent methods that have been applied in the past to um, various types of, of screening tools. Um, and it's a way to um, not only include or incorporate or describe some of this data, uh, but also to sort of set the stage for how that information could be incorporated in, in different formats in the future. Thank you, guys. Um, so our next question uh, is that 
Oh gosh, sorry, I got lost in all these questions here. Okay, is there an approach for public dissemination of a spatial tool that you prefer? So um, once you've developed the tool, is there um, an approach for public dissemination such as a focus group or a community meeting um, that you all talked about that you think might be best in certain contexts? I, I can start again. Um, you know, I, I I don't know how much it matters uh, what we think about the best approach for uh, the dissemination of the tool, but instead it should be it should be focused on communities and and how the how communities think uh, the best approach for disseminating this tool, the tool's results, and any other sorts of information about it. So, um, just going back to that the middle ring of the diagram, you know, talking about documentation and and about you know community engagement. I think dissemination discussions are a really important part of that. I would just add a little bit onto that as well. I mean, part of it is a question of what is the what is the tool being used for? So in the case of CJS, for instance, it's intended to inform decisions about federal funding and certain programs. So um, part of the dissemination process is getting the people who are supposed to be using the tool to actually understand it and use it in the intended way. And then the other part of the dissemination is the dissemination about the implications of the ways in which the tool is being used and whether or not it's meeting those objectives that have been set for it. So I think the question of dissemination has multiple dimensions to it um, and that um, you know, the, the approach that one might use would be different depending upon which of those parts of the dissemination uh, portfolio you're interested in. Yeah, so many of these things are so situationally dependent. Um, I know that you guys dealt with that in all of your recommendations and trying to make them them fit. Um, our our next question is uh, because census tracts are not homogenous, is there any concern that pockets of disadvantaged communities within a census tract may not be identified in tools such as CGEST and and other similar tools? Yes, certainly. That is a concern. Uh, census tracts are basically the given unit of analysis in CGEST, and there's good reasons to use um, census tracts, primarily, um, you know, national data coverage. But yes, that is a concern. Also, pockets of wealth in census tracts that may be considered disadvantaged could also, the inverse problem can also be a concern. Which is why, again, we brought up the um, the uh, modifiable aerial unit problem, a problem that's well known in geography and geospatial science, that when these aggregate spatial units are not homogeneous, you have the possibility of, you know, misdiagnosis, shall we say, of census tracts, and also the fact that these uh, results can change depending on, on things like census tract boundaries. So it, it is a concern, and we raise it as a concern for for um, a tool builder to think about. And this is why we need to do things like have tool validation, sensitivity analysis, supplemental analysis to make sure that we're not committing errors such as that. Yeah, and I would just add one other thing to that. I think that the, the other part of that is that, um, at least in the case of CGEST, it's a screening tool, meaning that it's intended to, in some sense, identify at one level potential recipients of funding. And then this heterogeneity question, this question about the fact that census tracts aren't homogeneous means that before you actually go to the next step of making those kinds of funding decisions, it's important to drill down a little bit more into some of the communities that either are or potentially are not being uh, included um, to make sure that um, when it actually comes time to making funding decisions or permitting decisions or other types of decisions that are being made based on the tool that um, that there's a more potential for incorporating some of those concerns about the fact that uh, that there are differences within the census tracts. I want to just add one more thing to that. I agree with those the comments of my colleagues um, that we did think about it a lot. It was a lot of conversation around that uh, and a lot of ref a lot of recommendations too from both of our the community members and stakeholders we spoke to who came to talk to us and gave presentations and our own conversations. Uh, and one of the things that, you know, this kind of connects to an earlier question about what if you miss a community, um, which I think is one of the concerns is whether we're getting it right. And that's where the, you know, you won't know 
uh, unless you know that that geography really well, or you have people in the room who know that geography really well to be able to point that out. And that's where that kind of that there has to be a channel between the tool developers and the affected communities to be able to identify that. There's be a, you know otherwise just how are you going to know? So it kind of feeds into itself not only technical uh, solutions but also this kind of relational uh, importance in terms of communication with communities. A great, great point. Thank you. Um, all right, we're going to try to fit a few more questions in these last few minutes. Uh, so um, our next question is, should environmental justice tools use similar modeling uh, methods as vulnerability and resistance tools? And if not, what are the differences between these types of tools? So I can start on that one. So some of the things are, so should they use the same approaches? This is going to be really highly dependent on the purpose and use of the tool. Um, even, even say within similar users, if, if something is being used for screening versus used for permitting, um, very different sorts of uh, um, usage there. I will say like many of the sort of vulnerability tools, um, kind of do get at this potential for, you know, intersectionality that Marcus was talking about. Um, but they do tend to focus more on, on social and demographic characteristics versus the EJ tools that have a lot greater emphasis on environmental burdens. So there are similarities. Um, and I think that there is this, you know, this whole field of, you know, social vulnerability modeling and, resilience modeling that we talk a little bit about in the report, they're tangential and they can be used as in part of the modeling process. I just wanna point out too that, um, that we reference other research that's looked at this kind of question about what's going on out there in the landscape of these approaches and tools. Uh, in our own uh, chapter four, looking at the survey of tools, we don't just do our own survey. We also review, there's been a growing body of research on that. And it is, uh, there's a number of resources that we we cite that folks can turn to if they want to learn more about the range of approaches that are being taken. But uh, I agree with Eric's point that there's a lot of similarity and a lot of overlap. Uh, and yet there are also a lot of gaps in terms of how to model some of these things like the interactions that uh, we're still learning about how these things work. Um, but I think that uh, those are both important points to remember. And we, we we tried to make those available to people to follow up on as a, as a research resource too. Thanks, Marcos. You're teeing up my last question pretty perfectly. So thank you so much for that. Our our last question is is really asking about what further research is needed to improve geospatial tools for answering environmental justice questions. I'd also like to invite all of our panelists if there's anything that didn't come up uh, during this webinar that you want to make sure people walk away from this hour with, I invite you to, to share that now, but maybe we can we can pull those together and when talking about, you know, what further research is needed and what you'll hope people will will take away from, from this report moving forward. Well, I can start, certainly start. Uh, we've talked about interactions and um, the chapter six on integration talks about all sort of the mathematical approaches you can do for integration of indicators, but the math needs to be based on an understanding of the processes. And currently the scientific foundation for understanding interactions among environmental and social pressures is lacking. And uh, there needs to be a, a greater understanding of, of those processes, and that will enable better representation in the tools. And I, I totally agree with what my co-chair Eric just said, is that, you know, the, the constructing the tools themselves, that, that has been worked out pretty well, that, that science is pretty settled. But what's going on in the real world with how these different stressors and um, social conditions, intersectionality, how these all interact to create cumulative burdens. There needs to be more domain research on that so we can understand how to build these real world processes that lead to cumulative burdens into tools like this. 
I think one of the things that is worth emphasizing and was already said at the beginning uh, a couple of times, I think, um, certainly with Walker, and I think Harvey said this too, is that there isn't one solution here. Um, I think ideally we wish there was one answer. Here is the disadvantaged community. Here is where the solution is. And and it's not that simple. And and both for technical reasons, but also because this is both a, a environmental and a social political question. Uh, and so those things are have various possible answers. And we need to be respectful of that. And that's why we want to bring as many people into the room as possible as we build them and we evaluate them. I think um, you know one one thing I'd like to see around research is is more research around uh, developing um, and implementing systems for validation of these tools generally. Just going back to one of the main words in the title of this report, um, how can we uh, best ensure that the right people are at the table? How can we take their input and continuously and, and iteratively improve, improve upon these tools based on um, um, input that that communities have and and the foundational partnerships that we've formed with them. So um, I I see it, uh, it's not a very structured process from, from my observation. And so I would like to see um, more research and more processes around um, really improving community engagement and improving validation and, and developing systems around that. Great. Well, thank you all so much. It looks like we're right at the, the end of this webinar. So thank you all for your fantastic questions and joining us here today. Um, once you exit this webinar, you'll be redirected to the report page where you can explore the highlights document and the report itself. Um, and with that, I'd uh, like to thank our fantastic panelists for your time serving on the committee and with us here today. Um, and thank you all again for joining. Have a great rest of your Monday.